I've owned over 2,000 pieces of real estate in my life. I've got several hundred million dollars worth of real estate today. One thing I know for sure is if you tell me the renters are going to pay the payments for you, that tells me you've never managed rental property. You are a novice at best, an idiot at worst. So you call people an idiot to think that, so yeah. I'm an idiot for yeah. thinking that? Like, like to use that as the reason why you wouldn't own a rental property? Right, his psychology around taking on debt is because he lost it all. Yep. So when he calls you an idiot for saying that doesn't happen or you don't know what you're talking about, yep. oh, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your host, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today, we're going to talk about why Dave Ramsey gives bad advice. Oh, boy. Dave Ramsey talks a lot about... Um, how bad getting into debt is. And I think that he no. leads people down the wrong path. Yeah, he's very black and white about it. It's he like there's is. no distinction between good debt and bad debt. Yeah. I want to play a clip here in just a minute. But before I do it, you know, the one thing about Dave is that Dave, uh, Dave, I did some research on him. And, you know, he's he was bankrupt before. He lost it all. Uh, mm -hmm. He Back in the 80s, he made great money, like quarter million dollars back in the 80s, worked for his dad's real estate company. And then he owned a whole bunch of property, and I'm not, I wasn't sure what recession happened or what, what happened exactly, but he got over leveraged, and when he got over leveraged, he lost it all, and he had to start from scratch. So I get that he has a real mental block with borrowing money. Like post-traumatic stress. <laughs> yeah. But what people forget all the time about Dave Ramsey when, he, when he's up there preaching the average person is that he also makes $30 million a year running his radio show, doing his talks, right. his book overrides, all that stuff that he gets. He makes $30 million a year in what we call like active income. Yeah. So when you make $30 million a year, you can sit on your throne yeah. and you can tell everybody else, just pay cash for real estate. But what about someone that doesn't have an extra $30 million? Right. Or even you know, after taxes, if he's taking home $17 million a year, he pays his, his he has no debt, great. That's a lot of money he has to put in things. And what's yeah. the average person that makes what? 50 grand a year, 100 grand a year as a household, and you, you're able to save an extra, what, a couple thousand bucks a year or 10,000 a year, and you have to pay for a house that's worth what? $200,000? Right. It took you forever to do that. So I think he's just given horrible advice and- And, and the advice comes from a, kind of a, like that is his business, is to give that advice. So he, he has like this conflict of interest in, you know, in, in giving the people what they wanna hear and yeah. making, you know, building his own platform and making his own business grow versus actually telling people what's best for them. Yes. And so, yeah. Plus, obviously, when you're online, you have to be controversial. So you have right. to you have to get in people's faces and piss people off. Right. Well, this is a little controversial right here, but Dave, your information kind of sucks. It's not great information to give to people. So you're and not it, and it's very it's very myopic. Like like you can't you can't put a one size fits all approach on everybody. No. And, and that's what it seems like he wants to do is just tell everybody no. this is the way to do it. And there's so many different scenarios were, which would require different yeah. strategies to be a good investor. I was, you know, I was intrigued by what he had to say. And, and I, you know, he's, he's obviously comes off as a very successful guy and he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. yep. online. It says he's worth a, a $200 million. I've heard he owns around $600 million worth of commercial real estate, free and clear. I've heard him say something to that effect before. So what the real number is, I don't know, but again, he's done very well for himself. Right. So I'm very happy for him and his success, but. This clip I want to play now was the clip where I saw it and said, buddy, you're out of touch with reality. Yeah. And this is bad advice. So check out this clip. I've owned over 2,000 pieces of real estate in my life. I've got several hundred million dollars worth of real estate today. One thing I know for sure is if you tell me the renters are going to pay the payments for you, that tells me you've never managed rental property. That tells me you've never done it. That's 100%. Not, you are a novice at best, an idiot at worst. And um, I mean, that's the truth because... Anybody who's ever had a renter or been a renter, and I have both, I've been a renter too, it knows that sometimes renters don't pay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's cancer. Sometimes there's car wrecks and job loss. Sometimes there's a pandemic. Sometimes dot, 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 dot. It's, you know, as if there's a perfect stream of every month the rent is going to come on time or early and you can pay your stupid little payment. And that's the most ridiculous assumption, which indicates a lack of experience or knowledge of how rental property really work. 
So I love where he says that if you think that's the case, that you're a novice at best, an idiot at worst. So you call people an idiot to think that. So yeah. I'm an idiot for yeah. thinking that. You know, I'm not worth hundreds of millions of dollars. We are certainly worth millions of dollars and has come from rental property. And I think that, I mean, I'm sure you'd agree. Of course, of course, there's vacancy. Of course. You plan for it, though. Like you, you do. You, you plan for it. And for him to use that, those kind of circumstances, you could apply that to any area of your life. He's like, there's cancers, there's car wrecks, there's, you know, all these different things and why people don't don't pay their bills. Yeah. That could happen to your job. Your your job could, you know, your company could go right. out of business. Your any anything could happen. You could get sick and not be able to work. Right. There, there's so many like like to use that as the reason why you wouldn't own a rental property. It's it's not like everything is roses and sunshine in any business. There's always gonna be things that come up. You so have to plan for them. This goes down your line that you like to discuss, <laughs> but it's his psychology. Right. Right. His psychology around taking on debt is because he lost it all. Right. And how bad of experience that was. I mean, I, I don't know how big his dad's company was or the company that he had, but I think it was thousands of properties that they lost. So when you got over leveraged, I'm sure that that took a major. So a, sure a, guy, a guy like Dave, that would be a major kick to his ego i mean that knocked him down a few pegs i guarantee it yeah. and so much so that now he says i won't get it. so i can respect his decision like i have i have friends that refuse to have debt that's great i just know that they're only going to have just so many houses because if you have to save to buy a house let's do some math right if you have to buy what's the average house now two hundred thousand dollars on the low side on the low side probably so if you want to buy a rental house is two hundred thousand dollars you're going to have to save two hundred thousand dollars here's the problem how long does it take the average American family to save 200 grand? Let's years if ever. Let's say yeah. let's say you can put away 40,000 a year after taxes. Or maybe you put it into a self-directed IRA, that's a different conversation which, for which later. Which that but would be very generous considering most people's average income. I think so, but I'm trying to be yeah, I, I think 20,000 a year is more realistic. People the average person can put away. Again, not a guy that makes $30 million a year right. or somebody else that makes a million dollars a year or 5 million. I mean, make $30 million a year. It's just, I'm, I'm happy for him. He's yeah. done well. I think he's done great with his, his, his online, his media presence. He's, he's been amazing with that. But it, his audience is the masses. So yes. We can't talk about the people that are making, you know, that, that are the one percent. He is. He We're is, talking about the masses. I don't, you know, I'm not sure what the exact number is, but I know if you make over a hundred, a little over a hundred <laughs> some thousand dollars a year, you're in the top 5% of the country. You make over 30 million, you are clearly in the 1% right. of the country. Right. So again, you're speaking to the 99% or who his audience are. Right. Because I hear people that come on his call. They're worth, you know, a couple hundred thousand. Some people are worth a few million because they've been saving and that's great. But let's get back to the rental stuff. So, you know, obviously when you are um, paying cash, if you have to save, if it's $20,000 a year, that's 10 years. Now, here's the problem. The house worth $200,000 today is not worth $200,000. In 10 years. It's worth $400,000 in 10 years, probably. It doubles, yeah. right? Real estate almost always doubles every, every 10 Every 10 years. to 15 years, depending on the market. Right. It'll double. So let's say it doubles. And now you save $200,000. By the time you get there, it's now worth double. So let's just say that you were smart. You could you could do somehow you had enough money put aside. You had a side hustle and you made forty thousand dollars extra a year after tax and put away. So in five years you have enough money. Now that two hundred thousand dollar house is probably worth two twenty, two forty, two fifty. It's probably worth more five years from now. Let's just say right. it might maybe more, maybe right. three hundred thousand. But whatever it is, you you have to save that money. So let's say you have to save for six years. Great. So now you buy that house. Wonderful. In that same amount of time. I could have bought 60 houses or 100 houses using other people's money and let it appreciate in value. You have one house that you finally can buy. And in the same six years, I could have, let's just say I bought one house a year for six years. And I had six houses that were now appreciating, right? Now you're talking about if I were to use, again, we buy a house with no money down, right? That's right. something that we're famous for doing. We do no money down using other people's money to do it. But let's just say you had to put now they have new here. This is pretty great. This is why I'm shocked that he wouldn't recommend this. You can buy real estate now with 5% down, mm -hmm. right? They have a new program out saying that you can buy rental properties. You can buy commercial property, I think four units and above. You can, I don't know the exact loss, so don't hold me to that, but I think it's, I think it's four units and above with FHA. You can put 5% down and buy that property. So if you have a hundred, let's say a, let's say a half a million dollar property, you could put $25,000 down and own and control that piece of property. Borrow, borrow the rest from the bank. Think about how fast that will appreciate in value. Yes, you have debt on it, but you know what's happening during this time? It's appreciating. Yes, and what else is happening? 
debt reduction. Yeah, they're because the tenants are paying the debt. Right. We should talk about that for a minute because when we when we calculate when we calculate how to buy real estate, what's the one thing we always figure in there? Oh, vacancy factor. Yeah, vacancy factor. So we know that yeah, there, there's a formula that you look at whenever you're yeah evaluating a rental property. I will agree with him in that if you only own one property, that's difficult because if you don't figure on that vacancy factor, right, or right. or you don't if you're running really tight on the margin and you only have one source of income right. and they don't pay the rent, that sucks. Right. But when you have multiple houses going Especially on. Especially if you're living off of that income. Yes, which I don't recommend that you should. I think right. that your I think that your investments you should not live off just like when you put money in a 401k. Right. I think when you buy real estate, you should not you should not try to live off that 300 bucks a month you make or 500 bucks a now, month you make or whatever. It can be a long-term play as a retirement plan. Yes. But not initially. Yeah, I don't yeah. think that correct. I don't think you should live off that till you're till you're ready to retire and right. cash out of the house. So anyway, that that's what I think people forget that, hey, listen, you got to figure out that if you have a 5% vacancy factor, that's what we figure out with single family homes, right? Mm -hmm. It's a 5%. But maybe you have a, a multi-unit building that's running a 7% vacancy factor or a 10% vacancy factor. That means that 10% of the time, it'll be vacant. Well, just figure that in. Right. And don't buy the property unless it cash flows based on all of the maintenance costs and all the upkeep costs and all of the mortgage costs and the insurance costs and the taxes right. and vacancy. Right. If you figure that in, then you know up front what you're getting into. Right, exactly. So yeah, you know, I, I think that you you had mentioned. Um, it, it's funny. A, a minute ago, you mentioned psychology, and and it is. It's it's like a scarcity mentality versus an abundance mentality. Right. So so when you're talking about you know you can save up and buy that one rental property versus using other people's money and in that same time frame buy 20, dozens 20 of times. dozens of properties 20 times, yeah. during that time that's the difference of scarcity versus abundance and yeah. and using strategy to your advantage versus the, this really contracted feeling because i i agree 100 percent when dave says you should live debt free but i think what he does not say that he should say you should live bad debt free right there's good debt and bad debt and he, according to him, no debt is good debt. Right. It's Again, very black and white. That's his psychology. But no businesses would have ever grown, including all the businesses that he invests in on the stock market. Mm -hmm. They borrowed money to get started, most of them, and they're on the stock market mm -hmm. borrowing money. They got people in there. That's, that's what they do. They have to have cash flow, so they borrow money mm -hmm. to do it. So you're investing in things that are appreciating in value because they borrow money, yet you won't ever borrow money. Right. And you make $30 million a year, so you know here you are right. on your high, your high horse, right? So I think it's so important that you remember there's good debt and bad debt. So tell about some bad debt. Bad debt is like credit card debt, you know, just going, you know, you're you're going out and buying expensive cars that you can't afford or right. even a house that you can't afford. Right. You know, you you still need to live within your means. I'm 100% yeah. with him on that. But when you're using other people's money to invest in properties or, or assets that are going to make you more money, that is not bad debt. Right. It's good debt. Good debt. Yeah, it's good debt. Because it's making you more money. Yes. You're investing. 100%. So I, I think and, that- and, and you're not only investing in like a crapshoot, you're investing in something that has a history yeah. of of appreciating. Yeah. I mean, never in history has, you know, real estate is, is by and large the best investment you can make. I laugh too, because one of the things that he said was, hey, you know, um, you know, you're again, I, I love that little line. You're either a novice at best or an idiot at worst. Yeah. So, and you've never managed a property. Well, it's funny. I've managed one property. We own 50, but I, we, I've managed one because once I found out about management, I wanted nothing to do with it. Remember? Right. right. So we didn't want to be landlords right. in, so, the, in the typical term. So what we do is we have a property management company that manages the properties for us. Right. And so we are not involved, just like when you go into a stock market or you buy a mutual fund or whatever it might be, there's someone that manages that for you. Now right. you're a little bit more involved because with a property manager company, I mean, I think I think our threshold is what, 500 bucks? Something like that. So if there's a if there's a repair over 500 yeah. bucks, they then have we to, have to approve it. We have to approve it. But that's just a, that's an approval. Right. They called us what? So, so let's talk about the bad of this, right? The bad is... What just happened to us? The year 2024 just starts and the, and we're like, okay, this is going to be a yeah. profitable year in our portfolio this year. And one of our furnaces went bad. So it's an $8,000 price tag. 8400 bucks, yeah. I think it was right out of the gate. So I'm like, God. Oh, uh, there went our profit on that Dang house. Dang it. So now we say there goes our profit, but that actually we did improve the furnace. So that right. won't have to be replaced for 30, 30 years. years. Yeah. So now it's there, but we had, we had the money because it had been making 500 bucks a month profit or whatever right. it was, right? But the property manager company took care of it. Right. But for the most part, we get a report. Actually, we don't. I see the report, but our accounting team does all the rest of it. 
So I think when people build a rental portfolio, I always encourage them, number one, you've got to have a property management company. Absolutely. Have to have that. Because that was the reason that I was kind of turned off when we first started investing in real estate. Yes. Um, you wanted to be, you wanted to have rental properties. I did. And I wanted to flip houses. And, yeah. and we've kind of done a, I've done a 180 on that. And I love our rental portfolio now because I see the benefits of it. And all the, you know, well, we it, have done a 180. You did a 180. I, that's I what I still, said. I did I a 180. Still, I still want to, yeah, I yeah. still want to buy more rentals. Now, at the yeah. time, we had to do flips because we, we needed we needed the cash flow. We, we needed, did. We needed to pay off some debt. Um, but the, that rental portfolio is our future. Yeah. And what happened with us is we started buying rental portfolio. And that, that's our one regret is we wish we would have started earlier doing Always. that. Always. Everyone says um, that. But we we started doing that, but then we stayed business and the rest stayed busy in the rest of our life, you know, with our with our flipping company and with our education company. We stayed busy with that and we just like let the property management company take over yeah. that and we we didn't really pay it much attention at no. all. And then next thing we knew, ten years later, yeah, it's worth millions of dollars in equity to us because we never paid it any attention, right. Because and, that time is going to pass anyway. The next 10 years are going to yes. go by anyway. Yeah. Why not invest in something that's going to grow? And we, the, the cool part of the people need to understand is that we didn't put any of our own money in. Right. So I always tell people, think of a house like an IRA, like an IRA that you didn't put money into. So we have, we have uh, one, of our, one of our community members, Dave and Alicia King, right? They've, they've done, we've done a lot of stuff for them. We love them and they're great. And one of their houses, we help them buy for nothing down. There was a tenant who's been there for 25 years, and that was why they were able to get the deal. They bought it for so cheap because the owner inherited the house from his dad. He was out of state. He had never seen it in 25 years. The tenants would not let any buyers in the house. They wouldn't let them in. So he had to buy the house sight unseen. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. So he had to buy the house sight unseen. I helped him negotiate that thing. So they have over a hundred and... I think it, don't hold me this. I think it's 140,000 in equity when they bought, because they bought the house for like, let's say it was $60,000. And they were going to pay for 90, but I helped them renegotiate. They got it for 60. Because mm -hmm. I said, you have to plan for, if you walk in there and it's a crack house or their foundation right. is dirt. Worst you, case you, scenario. Yeah. Yeah. I said, you have to prepare for everything. Right. I said, if they let you in, maybe you can give them a, more, a higher price, but they wouldn't let them in. So he bought it sight unseen. When they finally got in the house, I said, guys, what'd you find out? They said, Glenn, it's not that bad. Yeah. And the tenants have been there for 25 years and they have no intention. They feel like it's their house. Right. They want to be there until they die. Yeah, another they 25 years. Yes. Their credit's not great, but they pay their bill and they pay their rent. So now they have a tenant there. But when, when they had it appraised, it was worth 210000 something like that. Yeah. So they have $150,000 in equity. I remember saying to them, where else could you go out without using your own money yeah. and all of a sudden have an IRA that's now sitting there? Because I say an IRA because because all that appreciation grows tax deferred. That how that equity will get worth more and more. Yeah. The loan they took out on the property, the sixty thousand to buy it, will go down and down. Right. As people as they pay the rent, and so how you can think this is not a good investment is is beyond me. And that how could a pastor and a stay at home mom create that kind go of go get income. her wife? She's yeah. awesome. Go get her wife. How how could you create that kind of wealth? If you had to save even the sixty thousand to buy that house in the first place, you know you you have couldn't a, do it. You have that saying. Um, I don't know if it's yours or not, but it, we've heard it before. Let's you know, say it's if, mine. If you if you follow the masses, you're one of the asses. You know. Well, I say if you follow the masses, yeah, the masses have a silent, silent M. M. Yeah, I don't so, cuss like you but, do, but I... <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> you really want to go there? No. <laughs> um, but but that's who he's speaking to. Is he's speaking to the masses, and and also like I'm, I'm thinking back to that clip that we just listened to. And it's very um, like, what if? Do you really want to live your life on what if? Yeah. What if there's a vacancy? What if there's a car crash? What if somebody gets sick? Like we tell our kids that don't don't live your life based yeah. on what ifs. Don't don't base your decisions on anxiety. Do you ever make good decisions when you base them from an anxiety state of mind? You you want to make smart decisions and, and informed decisions. Yeah. And he he talks about the the con of being a landlord. You know these things could happen. All these what ifs. But what about the pros? Because the pros far outweigh, and even in that case, you were just talking about Dave and Alicia, yeah. the pros far outweigh the cons because there's there's real estate appreciation and there's cash flow. You know, th those houses may not make a lot per month while you're getting them going, but they do create cash flow and and there's leverage and there's tax benefits and there's depreciation. And there's like this whole list of, of reasons why it's a good investment. And yeah. I, I, it, again, his, his very 
black and white approach to, to taking on this kind of debt is not smart to listen to. What is the four things we talk about? We say, you know, when you buy any rental property, I don't care if it's a single family, multifamily, whatever it is, if you buy it right and you structure it right, you're going to have cash flow. Yep. So you're going to have money coming in every month. Usually not a ton of money, but you'll have some money. Right. I don't recommend spending that. I recommend using or living it. living off of it. Yep, yeah. Use it like a retirement yep. account. Let it grow up in the account, right? For when your furnace goes bad and it costs eight grand, you know, whatever it might yeah. be. Then you have cash flow, you have appreciation. So the property will grow every 10 years. Those properties double. Historically, that's always happened, right. right? Give or take. Can't hold me to the dollar figure on that, but give or take. On top of that, so you have cash flow, you have appreciation, you have depreciation. Yep. So you get to depreciate that asset over, you know, they take it 27 and a half years. You could actually condense it down, talk to your accountant about that. You can do what's called accelerated depreciation, another kind of yep. a tax strategy you can use. But you can depreciate that asset against your active income, right? Right. So you depreciate that against your active income, and now you can pay less in taxes. So you put more money in your pocket. So you have cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, and again, like you said, debt reduction. Right. Somebody else is paying off your mortgage. Yep. So when he calls you an idiot for saying that doesn't happen or you don't know what you're talking about, yep. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. And I don't know how many, but there's got to be millions of other landlords in the country. Some are small, some are bigger. You know, a lot of people just have a handful of houses that are their retirement. Our goal is to get a few hundred sashed away. That's what we're looking to do. And that's the path we're on. But give me a break. Like yeah, call people an idiot for that. That's, that's, I don't know. That's way out of line. And in addition to all those things you just said, there's a lot of other perks too. You know, you, you're building your own retirement income yes. as you're, as you're holding onto these properties. Yeah. And, and you also have a lot more control, you know, like you put yeah. your money in the stocks and you, you lack a lot of control there, but you know, heaven forbid something does happen and you need to sell one of your assets, yeah. you know, single family homes right now. Are, are valuable because yeah. there's a lack of them. Yeah. We, we are still, and probably for years, will be in a state of, of lack of inventory there. So if you need to to offload one of your properties yeah. for one reason or another, you could sell it. You also have to think about, you know, the, the, the power of having rental properties too is that, let's just say you get your hands on 10 of them. And in the next next few years, you have 10 of them. Again, if you use Dave Ramsey's method, well, good luck. You're going to have to save $2 million right. to do that. And you have right. to scrimp and save and have, and by the way, that's something else. You have to scrimp and save and have coupons for everything. Screw that. Yeah. I want to live, you live life. that way. Yeah. I don't. Enjoy life. <laughs> I, I have, I had an old friend of mine, a very close friend, and his dad was so cheap, um, <laughs> so cheap that he made them use newspaper as toilet paper growing oh, up to boy. save money. And one day, long after his dad had passed, he was in the shower and he's going, God, this shower has always sucked. And I grew up going there. I'm like, I'm like, man, this, this shower is terrible. He takes off the plumbing one day and finds a dowel that was shoved up in the pipe and drilled an eighth inch hole to reduce water flow. So the hot water, that's how stingy he was. Oh my goodness. And, and, in, and in that town, you don't even pay for water. The you guy, pay 25 bucks a year. <laughs> yes. The, the guy died of, the guy died of cancer and a, a few different kinds of cancer, which is very, very sad. But he died and left like 300 grand to his family. And I said, but at what cost? Yeah. You guys live like paupers. Like, who cares? Like, Dave Ramsey's like, oh, go, you know, go live in a hut. Give me a break. Yeah. Right. So, anyways, let me get off the Dave Ramsey tangent. Obviously, I don't like, I don't agree with that style of way of living. We yeah. go around this world one time and we don't all make $30 million a year, Mr. High Horse. So, and, and by avoiding all debt, you miss out on opportunities. You miss out on opportunities for a, a lot of better things in your life that are, that are higher yield. Explain. Just exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're in that state of mind where you're, you know, scrimping and using coupons yes. for everything and yes. avoiding debt at all costs. Yes. We, we actually had somebody that just posted this on one of our um, Facebook posts the other day. Yeah. Well, I'll listen to Dave Ramsey. Yes. You know, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not oh, going yeah, to debt. So often. Yeah. She's missing the bigger picture. Yeah. Because when you when you close yourself off to that and become closed minded to opportunities that yeah. may present themselves, whether it's real estate or anything else. Yeah. Well, let, let me finish my first thought, which is you led right into it. So if you use Dave Ramsey's method to try and buy 10 houses, you're going to have to ask yourself, how long will it take you to save $2 million? If you use our method and you buy 10 houses in the next two years, right, through borrowing money, right, leveraging money, if you want to put a down payment down, great. Like you may have to put a down payment down, but that's going to be 10% of two million or two hundred thousand, as opposed to two million dollars. Right. But if you borrow and get ten houses in seventeen years, roughly, if you take a twenty-year mortgage out, and then Dave says never take over a fifteen-year mortgage for your personal residence, I agree. But if you want to cash flow a piece of property, yeah. you can take out a twenty or twenty-five. The yeah. lower, the better. You can always pay it down early, like we do. We yeah. try and pay them down early. But when those houses are fully paid off, and let's, so let's say if you don't get the cash, the extra cash flow, you get three hundred bucks a month. 
If you wrap all that back in and use that to pay down principal every month, right? Use that to pay down principal. And it starts to compound too. It does. And so all of a sudden you're going to have 10 houses paid off in about 17 years. Mm -hmm. On average, 17 years from now, what will rent be? Probably talking $3,000. Probably. Probably at least because yeah. some, it depends where you are in the country. Some right. people are paying that now. But three or $4,000 a month, you'll have no mortgage. So now you'll own them debt free. You're going to have taxes to pay. You're going to have the same utilities, the same vacancies, all that stuff. But you'll probably, maintenance, yep. you'll probably be clear $2,000 a month per house. Yep. So it's $20,000 a month you make in retirement. Well, think about how long it would take you to save up to do that. And if you did it, that's that's using leverage to get it done. Yeah. And, so and I if think we're just missing the people miss the boat if they don't use leverage to buy real estate. They miss, and if you're only the using the stock market to invest, that's such a roller coaster that it could be up, it could be down. You yep. just you just never know. That's that's gambling. Real estate, for the most part, except for some pockets from the country, is always very, very consistent. Yep. And here's the beauty. I don't know if you could, and you might be able to, I'm not a stock market person, but if you're in the stock market and you have $2 million that you've uh, you know put in there, you might be able to get 10% or I know he preaches 12%. People criticize him for that because it's not easy to find 12% online, mm -hmm. but let's just, let's stay with 10 because easy math. You put $2 million aside and you get 10%. That's $200,000 a year you're making, right? In passive income on that $2 million. On those 10 houses that you purchase other people's money at 2000 bucks a month, right? That's going to be, what do we say it was? $20,000 $20, a month or $240,000 a year. Yeah. So it's a little more in income, but. With the other benefits. But with all the other benefits, right? You get all the tax deductions, all yeah. that kind of stuff. All, well, the tax deductions go away after a certain amount of time, but they keep appreciating. The houses continue to appreciate in value. 17 years from now, if you were to pay $200,000 for 10 houses, using other people's money, that's $2 million worth of houses. Right. 17 years from now, they're probably worth $5 million right. because houses double every 10 years. Yep. Let's say, let's say that it just doubles once in 17 years. $2 million in real estate is now, now worth four. $4 million in real estate and it's paid off. Mm -hmm. The $4 million is generating you $240,000 a month in income. If you wanted to, if you felt like Dave's plan was better, you could sell all those assets, get $4 million and put it in the market at 10% and pull $400,000 a month in income. Right. So you've got this asset that generates the revenue and people forget that you're building it. People are like, I can't do it. And I think even you, when we first got started, you're like, I don't want to do this for three. I, I didn't month. want to be a landlord. So, so remember the yeah. very, the very first workshop we ever went to with the woman who'd done 250 yes. flips. We thought that was, oh my God, she yes. was the Mecca. She was the, she was the bomb and she was, but I remember what turned me from, from renter to flipping, which I wish I had done both. But she said, why buy a property? and make 300 bucks a month cash flow when you could flip it and make, make 50, 30, 30 or yeah. 50, whatever it was back then. Yeah. And that got my attention because I needed yeah. money fast. Right. We've done over a thousand houses. Yep. If we had kept all thousand houses. Holy moly. Right. You're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, it, yeah. likely tens of millions, if not over, I can do the math real quick in my head, but I mean, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So again, don't be short-sighted when you're investing in real estate. Flip. We always have our, our flip to hold to method we teach, right? right? So flip two houses a year so you can make a hundred grand in flipping. And while you're doing that, hang on to a couple. Absolutely. And then we've gone through all the reasons why this is a powerful way to do it. And I think the one thing we should be careful of though is leverage, right? People, if you get over leveraged in the wrong things or you borrow too much on one house, that's where you can lose it. Yeah. That's what happened to Dave. Clearly, he got over leveraged. If you read about him online, he got over leveraged. And he was a young man when it happened. Hey, I got over leveraged. I went bankrupt when I was in my 20s. So I, I know all about that life. I've, I've been down the road, so I can appreciate the pain. I just didn't let it completely shut me off to other ways of doing business. Yeah. Right. So I think that people have to be very careful that you want to use leverage to reach your goals faster, but you really want to be careful to not use credit to buy crap. Yeah. Don't use it for your credit cards, for your living expenses, for travel, for fancy cars, clothes, um, I don't know, massages, whatever it might be. Yeah. You don't want to use money for that. You want to use leverage to buy assets that pay you money. Yeah. He, he's he got a quote, uh, live like no one else. So later you can live like no one else. But when he's saying that, he's emphasizing the importance of making sacrifices 
and and making these responsible financial choices now yeah. so you can have a better life later. Well, you know my answer. Yes. Do today what others don't so you can have tomorrow what others won't. Exactly. So I want to I don't want I would I would flip that quote yes. on its on its side and say exactly. Yes. Like live <laughs> make make good choices now, sound choices now and responsible financial choices now so you can have the life yes. now and later. You can have it now and later. Yes. Again, like my friend's dad, people that scrimp and scrimp. And some people might listen to this now and go, I'm going to keep scrimping. Well, great. If, you, if that makes you happy, scrimp. Yeah. If that, if that gets your juices flowing. <laughs> my, that our, reduces your anxiety. I want friend, Erin. I love her to death, right? I love her. She's, the she's, queen I, of Groupon. I, I see, she's queen of Groupon, right? She, she loves she, to she, save she's up. She's our son, son's godmother. We she love is. Her. I love her so much. And she's listening to you. Hi, Erin. But, you know, she is famous for looking. And I tease her all the time. She wants a Groupon. But yeah. that's her thing. She loves to save money. Me? I love to earn money so I can spend money. Yeah. So just a different mindset. You have to make sure, I think, at the end of this, at the end of this whole episode today, I think that, you know, there's a lot that Dave Ramsey gets right. You know, he yeah. he's he's a smart guy. He knows how to invest in real estate because he does. So he knows how to do that. He's very intelligent with money. He he I believe he gives that advice from his heart. I think he's saying to people, look at I've been I've lost all my money because I was over leveraged. Don't ever do it. Because yeah. he has a fear. And he's doing it out of the goodness of his heart. He's saying, don't, don't do that. that. That's a really interesting point. I want to pause you right there. That's a really interesting point that you bring up. Because even when we do like our workshops and education business, we, we caution people on, you know, be careful of the naysayers because you're going to have people in your life that are going to tell you, don't get into real estate investing because they're trying to protect you. Yeah. You know, even, it, and a lot that's of times true. it's even like close family members, your parents, you know, they're going to, they're going to advise you against it because from the goodness of their heart, they don't want to see anything bad happen to you. They want to protect you. Yeah. But the thing about real estate investing is it's so calculated and, and you can make good decisions based on data. And, and today of all days, like oh. with all of the information out there, that information is even easier to get the access to it. So you can make really, really educated, conscious decisions going forward. So yeah. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I just I, I think that's a really why, valid why point. Why is that a different day for the other day with interrupting me? Why is that different? But like you were saying, he probably is doing it from the goodness of his heart yes. and trying to give people good advice. Yeah. I just disagree with a lot of it. I, I think I think that I'd like to close with just saying that, you know, he does have a lot of things that are right. I do think there's a lot of things that, are, that he's that he's not correct about. I think he's wrong about it. And um, I think that you have to decide what's best for you. Right. Again, do you want to, do you get off on saving money on Groupon, Aaron? Do you, <laughs> you know, get off on having coupons and, and figure out how you can go to dinner and all of you split a meal? Or do you sneak popcorn to the movies? When I grew up, my dad used to sneak yeah. popcorn in the movies. Well, I went to one movie growing up and it was a little baggy because my dad, I love, my dad was the cheapest man alive, but he always had cash saved around, right? And so do you want to live like that? Does that make you excited? Because if it does, go for it. That's your life. But if you want an abundant life where you have a lot and you can, and you have a risk tolerance, we should wrap with that, yeah. is that you have to have a risk tolerance. Dave doesn't have a risk tolerance anymore. He lost it when he went bankrupt. Yeah. And I get it. Like I went bankrupt. I had that same thing. I, I had to decide to, to allow risk into my life because if I allow risk, I can allow greatness to happen much faster and financial gain to happen much faster. There is a possible risk because you could get over leveraged and you could lose it all. Mm -hmm. And it's scary, but it could happen. But if you don't take that risk, you'll never have the reward because how, how long would it take you to save $2 million? You've got to be really honest with yourself about and, and that. And if you are more conservative and, and you have that, have that low risk tolerance, there are conservative deals that you can get into too. You don't have to take the high risk hundred percent. You can get it. Yeah, let's, well, yeah, you can get into REITs, uh, the real estate investment trust. They're a lot more, they're a lot safer than doing it by yourself. A lot of places you can put your money that you're still in real estate and be part of it. So, so with that. I would say just be yourself, decide what works best for you and take the plan, but don't listen to Dave Ramsey just because he has a huge platform because he does make $30 million a year after all. So telling you to save your money to buy a house is not really good advice for the average American. That concludes today's episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe so that you get all that future content. And if you're listening or watching on another platform, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing.